Good morning. Good morning. Stories entertain, stories instruct, stories create a shared history. Stories can hurt as well as heal. In short, stories are powerful in how we view the world as well as how we view the possibilities for the future. And these stories determine the legacy we leave for our future generations. These are, the, these are words that we find in the current CSCA annual convention booklet written by Kevin Barge, who is the organizer for this year's convention. And it's very appropriate that Kevin shares that vision with us through this particular conversation because we are convened here today to continue a conversation about the legacy of Central States Communication Association. Last year, the past officers presented the first of three dialogues with former officers and presidents of the association so that we might have a way of continuing the oral history of Central States Communication Association. It's very appropriate that in our 70th year, in fact, Central States, not under that particular name, was founded in, in 1931. It's very appropriate that during our 70th year, we have a distinguished panel of past officers who are going to share with us today some of the experiences that they brought to the organization, how the organization influenced them, and how they influenced the organization in turn. Last year, we were very privileged to have a similar panel. Last year, for our first dialogue, we had Paul Bowes, who was the president of the association 1968 to 1970, Will Lundkugel, who was the uh, president of the association right after Paul Bowes, and Ken Anderson, who was the president of the association from 1974-75. We, at that time, framed what the early history of the organization was and talked about the organization during those presidencies. Well, this year we're picking up the 1980s and extending through that next decade, which was a very pivotal time, as you will hear as our guests talk about the legacy that they are bringing for us forward today. Joining us today are Bruce Gronbeck, who was president of the association from 1977-78, currently at the University of Iowa. Gus Friedrich, president from 1980-81 at Rutgers University currently. Dennis Gowron at Penn State, who was a president from 1984-85, and David Zarevsky, Northwestern University, who was president 86-87. The moderator for our panel today is Judith Trent, who was also a president during that decade. Judy served 1981-82, and Judy's affiliated with the University of Cincinnati. And at this time, Judy, I'll let you take over the responsibilities mm -hmm. of con continuing the legacy. All right, thank you, Linda. Uh, I do want to uh, thank you for being here this morning. I know that our discussion will be every bit as fun as it was as it was last year. What we've done is we have, uh, Linda and I put together a, a group of questions and we're asking each uh, panelist to respond to them in terms of how it was when they were one of the leaders of the association. Of course, for this particular group of panelists, that was a pretty long time ago. But, <laughs> but be that as it may, if they can remember back, <laughs> uh, the oldest of the group, Professor Grombeck, <laughs> will, I, we are asking him the first question, uh, and that is, what has been and is the role of central states in the communication discipline, and did it or does it have any uniqueness from other disciplinary associations? Bruce? It, it is kind of scary to think that I was moving into that office a quarter century ago, because I still think of myself as a 36-year-old in a 60-year-old body. Uh, of course, I was 36 at the time I was president of the association. Uh, I was probably the youngest, well, we thought I was probably the youngest president, uh, although then we just forget about that argument when Judy came along and she was 18. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is a pleasure, in spite of everything she said, uh, to, be, to be asked to come here uh, and, and, and talk about this. Uh, starting out with a question about, about the role of, of central states in the discipline, historically, I, it's, I think it's interesting because the central region is essentially the, the, the birthing region for the national association uh, in, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. Uh, 
My former colleague Deirdre McCluskey is fond of talking about, about the Midwest uh, as a place of civility and the great search for community through the late 19th and through much of the 20th century. And he always found uh, it absolutely unremarkable that, that the, the formal study of rhetoric and then communication broadly would be founded in and among a series of Midwestern universities, probably around a great triangle that ran from Ann Arbor to Chicago, uh, and then either to, to Madison, Wisconsin, or Iowa City, depending on uh, where your allegiances were, and then a, a range of, of four-year colleges in and around uh, and, and through that region as well. Uh, it is it is the the nature of, of community itself. It seems to me in the Midwest that not only gave our discipline uh, a large push, but as well then became uh, imp important reasons why it would be in this area that the regional associations grew fastest. And certainly when I was president, we were far and away the largest of the regional organizations at, at, at that. And as well, why you would have uh, not only a uh, majority of the f original famous 14 founders of, of the National Association coming out of the Midwest, but the stream of presidents, uh, as you look up and down this table, you're also, of course, looking at presidents of the now the National Communication Association. And it, it's, it's that, that sort of, of uh, it seems to me, cultural force emanating out of, out of the Midwestern life that made this association terribly <coughs> important intellectually uh, as well as, as professionally as, as it develops. Uh, and, and, and as well, it is out of that range of institutions that you had, if you look at, if you look at the early issues of, of, of the National Journal as well as the coming of the regional journals, uh, you'll find the fountainhead of scholarship beginning to, moving out of there as well. So it seems to me that, that it, this organization puts its stamp on, on, on the whole field. I, I think one... One more way it does that is, is you look at the earlier history of, of Eastern with a strong professional uh, emphasis on the Southern Association with a phenomenally strong regional identification in a lot of, a lot of its work. Uh, and, and, and the Western, Western Association searching for, as you look at the early issues of its journals, for identity for, for along the way as, as well. That, that what you had anchoring this association was what we often refer to as, as the great Midwestern speech and dramatic art department. That is, we grew our intellectual roots in and around anything, as, as deans used to talk about, anything that, that somehow has to do with, with, with voice. Uh, a wonderful diagram that was done by, uh, by the, the 30s chair of the, of the uh, Department of Speech at Iowa showed seven disciplines with, with the oral or in the middle and then seven disciplines, speech pathology and audiology, theatrical performance and so on and so on, all laid out as, as, as radiating spokes from that center. We built those kinds of departments that, that allowed for, for the discipline to take its shape as a, as a multifaceted, really, with multiple sub-disciplines that came out of those great sprawling Midwest departments. And that, in turn, affected then the way the profession got organized in the associations. Uh, and I think we, none of the others were built that way at all. We're built on much more, more particular ranges of, of, of emphases. So uh, in, in that sort of way, obviously, central states, it seems to me, marked the field uh, in, in very, very direct ways. Where it is now, we can talk about later. But it seems to me, in, 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 uh, from the 30s to, to the period that we're dealing with, it's, it's a dominating institution. Thanks, Bruce. We're going to go to Gus Friedrich, and I do want to note for the record that not only was Gus president in 1980-81, but he also served as executive director, correct? Yes. In mm -hmm. Earlier, 1974. Save my 74. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Gus? Yeah, I, I just uh, uh, maybe a couple of uh, words of context, too. I agree completely with uh, Bruce's assessment. But I would point out also that uh, if we look at history uh, of higher education, we can go back to the first institution, 1636, uh, uh, Harvard University, and point out that uh, rhetoric was a strong part of education then. And uh, that was on the East Coast. So if we would look in terms of the founding of our discipline uh, before uh, uh, we had departments uh, and when we had the first institutions, rhetoric was a very prominent part of uh, higher education. 
and it was with the land-grant institutions of the 1860s when higher education grew dramatically, and we started getting departments that uh, it moved to the Midwest. And that became a movement from uh, first trying to train professionals, first the clergy, then the lawyers, then the teachers. But then it became broader with the land-grant institution uh, as we uh, included many more people in higher education uh, uh, with the move to include engineering and uh, the mechanical arts as that was described then. Within that context, uh, then, uh, uh, the uh, departments that Bruce talked about were uh, uh, founded. And I find it kind of interesting, for the reason that uh, Bruce mentioned, we were the last regional founded. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lauren Reed uh, has a delightful little pamphlet that he did in terms of the uh, 50th year, 31 to uh, 88, 81. And I, I think it's kind of interesting. I'm sidetracking just one second. But uh, in terms of that, I think Lauren is wonderful in terms of precision. 50th year, he didn't talk in terms of anniversary because if you notice, it says 60th, uh, 69th annual convention. Well, not really true. The uh, uh, association, uh, uh, as Lauren points out, could be dated back to 1931, but the first conference didn't happen until 33. And then uh, the third one, I believe, was canceled because of lack of interest. And uh, then in terms of uh, World War II, there were four that were not scheduled. The first one was not uh, held, it was canceled uh, in sympathy for uh, World War II, and then four were canceled. So essentially we've had 62 rather than 69. So this isn't the 69th <laughs> annual, and uh, it's the 62nd <coughs> annual. And so we, we have some difficulties in terms of that. And then some of the early presidents, of course, held multiple years in terms of the sequence. So you can't talk in terms of the ex-president, uh, and so there's some confusion uh, in terms of the numbers. But I just wanted to, uh, back to my task, just uh, briefly read a paragraph from Lauren Reed's because it points out why, within the context of the leadership that Bruce talked about, our association was the slowest to be founded. Lauren says, a major reason was that we had such a close kinship with the national organization, then called the National Association of Teachers of Speech, or NATS. We had supplied 15 of its 17 founding fathers. Of the three most distinguished founders, James O'Neill, Charles Woolbert, and James Winans, the first two were from the central state's institutions. Six of its first 10 presidents and three of its first five editors came from our area. We practically owned the National Association. Most of its conventions were in our front yard, Chicago, Cleveland. Those who thought about a new regional group frankly said, quote, we don't need a regional we can meet so easily at the time of the national convention. Or, if we do form a regional, we don't need a special convention except during those rare years when the national doesn't meet in our area. And so I think uh, it, it is the case that we were among the last uh, to be started, uh, but primarily from reasons of strength rather than reasons of weakness. Thanks, Des. We turn now to Dennis Goward, and I do want to also point out that in addition to being president of this association, he was also editor uh, of the journal at one point, right? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Uh, well, since uh, <coughs> Professor Gronbeck uh, spoke to us uh, from his 36-year-old uh, mind and 60-year-old <laughs> body, in the interest of balance, I suspect that I ought to rely on my 60-year-old mind uh, <laughs> to uh, present myself in my 36-year-old body. <laughs> I did not know when I entered the profession in 1968 what the purpose of a regional association was. I'm not sure that I really knew what the purpose of a national association was. So for me, uh, coming to grips with this question, uh, if I'm to be honest, represented a, um, an experiential learning uh, approach. I think as uh, uh, my uh, respected teachers made it uh, clear that uh, individuals aspiring to the uh, profession of university and college level teaching had a responsibility to be active in professional associations. I was compliant and uh, um, became a member of the Central States Speech Association then and the uh, Speech Association of America. But it wasn't until I started attending conferences and getting to know people that I came to develop certain appreciations 
uh, not only of what regional and national associations in general are designed to accomplish, but what was unique about the Central States Communication Association. It seems to me that uh, historically, uh, the Central States Communication Association has been first and foremost an organization that was established to promote scholarly uh, interests and ongoing programs of scholarly research and to give people an opportunity to uh, share the results of their inquiries uh, in an arena where they could acquire feedback and uh, if depending on the nature of the feedback, we're so inclined to advance uh, the agenda. I think that remains uh, an important function of any kind of professional organization uh, associated with our discipline or other uh, disciplines uh, in uh, higher education, in secondary education, and in uh, public school education. Um, to have a venue in which it is possible to let people know uh, what they are collectively uh, arriving at in the way of understandings about the issues that are of interest to us, both personally and, uh, and collectively. I think uh, during my tenure of association with this profession, however, I have been witness to a broadening of the scope of interests that this uh, organization serves. Uh, not everyone who attends meetings here is interested in hearing what other people have to say about their scholarship, although I defend that as an important function of professional organizations. But I think it has also grown to be more accommodative in terms of uh, people's interests in professional development, their interests in teaching-related issues, their interests in innovations, in uh, uh, instruction. And in that sense, uh, I have, uh, during my tenure, seen the organization diversify and, I think, satisfy a much broader set of interests than was true when I uh, first entered it in 1968. Uh, as to its uh, uniqueness, uh, not being a member of other regional associations, it's hard to comment on how we might be distinguished from those. Uh, I've not attended that many conferences of other uh, regional associations. Uh, but I would say that this organization strikes me as being unique in a number of uh, respects, uh, not the uh, least of which is that it is uh, uh, supportive of a uh, kind of collectivism that I think is uh, valuable and healthy for people in organized disciplines. I find the people at this uh, uh, meeting and at meetings I've attended in the past to be very receptive to one another's ideas. I mentioned this in a panel I attended yesterday when we were asked, what is it that uh, this association does that is uh, positive? And uh, that's an important positive in my view that uh, uh, as you see people interacting at meetings of uh, the con uh, convention annually, uh, it is with more of a genuine interest in what others are finding and what they are reporting and what they are interested in. I, I find in my association with uh, the National Communication Association a much higher level of impersonalness uh, and more of a self-centered, egocentric uh, um, motive for, uh, for participation. Here, uh, it's, the atmosphere is quite different. So I think we are unique in that respect, at least in uh, contrast to uh, national uh, organizations. And that's not a put down of NCA. I value my membership in that organization as well. I just think its very size uh, militates against the possibility of this kind of uh, collegiality. And people are under more pressure, it seems to me, uh, to produce in ways that will gain them notoriety at a national level and under less pressure to do so at a regional level. But the impact on one's uh, appreciation for what others are doing uh, is um, uh, important from my point of view, and uh, I see us as, uh, as unique in that respect. I see us as uh, unique in the uh, uh, 
extent to which we are willing to accommodate a variety of interests that go beyond uh, the advancement of, of scholarly agendas and uh, enter more uh, significantly into people's uh, uh, professional lives and their uh, concerns about how to develop uh, as professionals. And finally, I would say that uh, I think that this uh, organization has been a, a, a crucible for the production of leadership. Uh, and it's already been mentioned that uh, people seated at this table uh, have gone on to uh, uh, distinguish themselves at uh, other levels and in many uh, different capacities. I just took a, a look at past uh, uh, presidents of this association between 1978 and 1990 of the 12 people who were elected president of the uh, Central States Communication Association five uh, went on to become National Association, uh, National Communication Association presidents, and there is one who is president-elect of that organization, which I think is a pretty impressive record, and it's an organization that's given people, like those of us, the opportunity to develop uh, leadership. Thank you, Dennis. And last but not least, David Zareski, would you respond to this question? Well, my distinguished senior colleagues on the panel <laughs> have uh, spoken well of the history of the association. Uh, I take their word for it <laughs> and agree with uh, what they've said. I would say simply that I think, uh, to borrow a phrase, Central States is the indispensable regional association. And I think we saw very clear evidence of that during the years in which most of us served as president when, quite frankly, the financial viability of the association was called into question for reasons that we'll probably talk about uh, later in the discussion. And it was encouraging to hear sympathetic colleagues from other regions express in one way or another the view that if central states were to go under, the profession would go under. And I think when we sort of unpack that statement, uh, we really see that it's, that it's the case. Not only is this region historically the heartland of, of our profession, but it remains so, not just geographically, but uh, in terms of the leadership of the discipline, the key institutions. And so within that context, I think the, the somewhat unique function of central states is to provide the depth of intellectual infra infrastructure uh, on which our, our discipline depends across the country. Uh, it, it, Dennis pointed out that it's been something of an incubator for national leadership of the profession. It's also, I think, been an incubator for our scholarship. It's provided a place for senior and junior faculty and aspiring faculty and graduate students and, uh, to some extent, undergraduate students to come together around current issues in research and teaching and the public face of the profession. And those have often been the issues that have really defined the central concerns of, of our discipline. So it's been both a, a kind of regional representative of the very best of our work nationally, and it's also been, as I said, an incubator or a catalyst uh, to the development of that work along just about every dimension we might imagine. Thank you. Uh, let's turn our attention to a second question that Linda and I uh, ask our panel to address, and that is to describe the association, the development of the association during the time of your leadership. And here we may get into some of the uh, issues that David uh, discussed, but in terms of membership or convention programs, attendance, journals, special projects, the overall vitality of the association, virtually those things that you think were really peak development uh, situations at the time of your leadership. We'll start this time, if you will, with Gus. I, uh, like Dennis, uh, got my uh, degree in 1968, and my first Central States uh, convention was uh, Will Lengugel's convention in 1969. Uh, I got my PhD at the University of Kansas, and Will Lenkogel was a faculty member there. And uh, uh, obviously, I was socialized to believe that uh, it was important to go to the state, the regional, and the national associations as part of my education. So I went uh, to uh, that meeting at the uh, Case Park Plaza in St. Louis, April 18th to 19th. And I thought I'd just kind of share a little bit of context uh, in, in terms of showing how things have developed over the years. Uh, that program uh, went from 9 a.m. on Friday to 3 p.m. on Saturday. So we've expanded it on both ends uh, since uh, that. 
Uh, there were 130 individuals on that program. Uh, there are 675 here. So there are more panels, there are 180 sessions here, than there were individuals uh, listed as participants in that uh, 1968 convention. If you pick up and look at that little uh, uh, fold, uh, it read uh, as part, all wives attending the convention are cordially invited to a coffee reception in the president's suite, immediately following the keynote address. Check at the information desk upon the arrival for the room number. That was uh, standard in convention programs until uh, Jerry Anderson's convention in uh, 1973 in Minneapolis. Uh, Jerry's at the top of page 33 read, uh, what did it read? Uh, it said uh, at the bottom of page 30, uh, at the top of page uh, 33, there was a program, Feminism, Sex Roles, and Communication, quote, The Hard Facts. That was uh, 73. But at the bottom, it said, Spouses of members are cordially invited to a coffee reception in room 1473, the President's Suite. And so uh, um, uh, things have changed a little bit. If we look uh, at the uh, years uh, that we represent, uh, uh, there were exactly seven women presidents up until the year uh, uh, 1990. And the first one being Charlotte Wells in 6061, uh, and the uh, second being Charlotte Lee, 67 and 68, Barbara Larson, 78, 79, and then Judy Trent, 80, 81. And uh, then if you look at uh, the uh, program since uh, 1990, you'll notice that seven out of the 12 listed there are women. So uh, things have changed a little bit, probably not uh, uh, as much as they ought to, but they have changed. In terms of just looking at, uh, and, and I, I, I'll uh, maybe uh, later look a little bit in terms of uh, uh, the uh, executive uh, secretary kind of role uh, that I performed from 75 to 77. Uh, but uh, looking at my convention program, I went back and looked at it. Uh, I planned the program, the uh, 49th annual, as we called it then, which it wasn't, in the uh, Radisson, Chicago. And I continued, uh, David Berg was my predecessor, uh, and I continued his little, th this was a little folder that you could pr print in half and stick in your pocket. They had, uh, Dave Berg had started uh, program at a glance. So you could pull the convention program out, flick it open, and you could see at a glance what programs were going on at each particular time period. So I continued that. The year before, David had started uh, Spotlight on Scholarship featuring Ernie Borman from the University of Minnesota. I continued it and featured Jesse Delia. Uh, I expanded the uh, time slot to starting to Thursday at 1.30. And uh, I also added, there were six programs at a slot. I added seven. So at each particular time, there were seven. Uh, I uh, started something called Office Hours and had Jane Blankenship, Ron Allen, Jerry Miller, and Carlin Campbell featured as Office Hours where they met with anyone who wanted to come in and talk with them. Uh, I also had uh, Denny Gowran uh, there as the uh, editor of Central States to talk with people, and Carl Moore, the executive director, uh, uh, to talk with people in the association. So that was part of the office hour program. And I also had a meet the uh, SCA candidates at the time, who were Ken Anderson and Bill Brooks that year. Okay. A feature that I, uh, I, I started and nobody picked up, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm proud of it, and so I'm uh, going to mention it again. <laughs> Maybe somebody will pick it up. Uh, but I, I, I thought it was fun uh, to uh, treat in sort of humorous kinds of ways uh, some of the uh, features of the discipline. And so I put a panel together, uh, and uh, Bruce Grombeck was the moderator for that panel called uh, Have You Heard the One About Reflections on a Discipline? And it featured Bob Scott uh, talking about academic administration goes big time, confessions of a slow learner. It had Bob Norton talking about the history of speech, part two. It had Herb Ryan talking about the complete history of speech from A to Z. And it had Gerald Miller talking about not significant, but in the right direction, some humorous <laughs> trends in the field. And so that's where I'll, uh, I'll leave uh, my brief comments here. Thank you, Dennis. Well, I was amazed that Gus could recall the dates uh, of a 1968 convention. I thought the, I only, cheated. the only people in our profession who have that kind of recall are former debaters, and then only in the case of unwarranted losses. Uh, 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 I remember. <laughs> 
During the uh, period that I served as president of the uh, association and in the uh, couple of years leading up to that, um, in regard to the specific categories we were given here, my recollection is that uh, there are some stabilities and there have been uh, some changes, but there may be more uh, evidence of remarkable uh, stability. Um, but one certain uh, positive uh, change in respect to one of these subcategories. Insofar as membership was uh, concerned, that was uh, something that we wanted to expand. Uh, in 2001, we want to expand uh, membership. We don't feel we are big enough. We don't feel that we are reaching enough of the people who are practicing scholars and, and teachers in our region. Uh, over the years, varieties of uh, membership campaigns have been attempted, but we tend to be a rather stable organization in terms of size, and uh, uh, that has its uh, uh, positive and its negative side. I think one of the things that continues that I've noticed over the years is that individuals join these associations, get a job, and then drop out of the uh, organizations. And to some extent, I think that uh, that has continued uh, over time. You like to see more people maintain their uh, uh, professional membership. Uh, if everyone who came in in any given year stayed and became a lifer, then we'd be a fairly large organization by now. Uh, insofar as convention programs and attendance are concerned, I mentioned previously that I think our uh, programs have diversified and accommodated a variety of interests that were greater, are greater now than uh, was true in 1985 and 1984 when I, I planned the uh, convention. Insofar as attendance is concerned, I heard the report this morning at the business meeting that uh, as of this morning it looked like there were about uh, 450 paid attendees with uh, individuals still coming in. Uh, the year I was president of the association, we had a conference in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, and there were 450 paid registrants at that uh, convention. Uh, I recall when 600 was viewed as a uh, really good convention year, 700 was phenomenal, but we seem in terms of convention attendance to have uh, maintained a uh, uh, fairly limited, uh, limited range. Uh, insofar as journal, uh, the journal was concerned, uh, the big problem, I think we'll have occasion to talk about this more, was that we didn't have one uh, for <laughs> quite some time. Uh, uh, we were in arrears, uh, you might say, uh, when uh, uh, I was president of the association. When I uh, gave up the editorship, or ended my uh, term as editor, uh, the journal was back on schedule, but uh, uh, due to some creative uh, financing and uh, questionable financial practices, uh, <laughs> we were not able to pay our bills, which uh, put us in arrears for a 17-year period that <laughs> Paul uh, Mangeau uh, indicated this morning is now part of our history, and I'm pleased to uh, hear that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't uh, recall that I initiated any uh, particular special projects uh, or had a, uh, an, an agenda. Uh, Dr. Trent encouraged me strongly to be a candidate for office, and uh, I uh, discovered that after I was elected, we had financial problems of a serious nature. And, uh, <laughs> later in the decade, she encouraged me to stand for election of president of then Speech Communication Association, and after being elected, I was informed that we were in need of a severe uh, increase in dues. Uh, so uh, my agenda was to serve as the focus of hostility <laughs> in two different organizations. Um, uh, overall vitality of the association, uh, I think, is great. Uh, I uh, uh, left the region, but I maintain my uh, home base as the Central States uh, Communication Association. I think it is the, uh, in spite of uh, some of the problems that it had in the past, uh, uh, a very strong organization. And I would uh, agree with David's assessment that there was a period where uh, um, people throughout the uh, 
country were very concerned uh, that if we uh, did not address those problems successfully that the entire discipline, uh, not just this organization, might be in trouble. Uh, and uh, the vitality that exists today, I think, is a reflection of the kinds of personalities you see impaneled here today, uh, despite the uh, bad name that rationality has in some quarters of our discipline. Uh, these were individuals who uh, behaved rationally in the face of crisis and uh, have vindicated my scholarly position. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. David. <laughs> uh, my, my years in the leadership of the association, I think it's fair to say, were consumed by the financial issues to which Dennis referred and continued after he left office through no fault of his. <laughs> uh, the, Thank you. The, <laughs> the problem, quite frankly, was originally misdiagnosed. Uh, it looked on the surface to be the following. The journal had fallen behind in its publication schedule. Membership billing was tied to the issuance of the journal so that when a journal didn't appear, members weren't billed for renewals. And our other main source of income, which was revenue from the other regionals on the exchange of journals, was also tied to the appearance of the journal. So it looked as though we were simply digging ourselves farther and farther into a hole as everything was tied to the journal. Uh, we had difficulty understanding uh, this set of circumstances or how it could have happened uh, because in the transition of executive secretaries, records were not turned over uh, in timely fashion. Uh, it uh, fell to, to me at the time that I became president to try to figure out, with the help of our other officers and, and leadership, uh, what kind of strategies to pursue to try to remedy the situation, because it was clear that if we did not, uh, then the, the viability of the association was indeed in jeopardy. And so we really did two things. Uh, one is with the uh, courage of a new executive secretary, Larry Miller, uh, we began aggressively seeking to recover back dues as well as current dues, even while we had yet no journal uh, to show. And we really, uh, quite frankly, appealed to the, the faith and confidence and uh, goodwill and good judgment uh, of the membership, and the membership by and large came through. Uh, the second thing we did is we realized that in order to get out of the hole uh, in which we were in, uh, we had to have an infusion of a rather large uh, amount of money that would enable us to remedy this backlog in publication. And so after considerable soul searching about how to do it, uh, we went hat in hand to the National Association uh, and sought a loan that would enable us in the short run to get the publication back on track. Uh, the National Association was uh, a bit askance at this, this request and uh, was concerned that they were uh, making an unsecured loan since uh, we started from the premise that our financial health was in jeopardy. What, after all, did we have as collateral? We had all these unpublished issues of the, of the journal. And so uh, in response to a challenge from the, the leadership of the then SCA, uh, we got a number of current and former officers and leaders of central states to agree personally to back up uh, this loan. Uh, the end of the story is positive. We ended up needing to borrow much less than we thought we would. We were able to pay it back much sooner uh, than we thought we would. Uh, so that all went uh, very well. The downside is, uh, after I left office, uh, it became clear, in fact, in the year after I was president, that the problem was not simply that the journal had fallen behind, that the, the problem was more serious and, in fact, criminal uh, in, in nature. Meanwhile, however, the conventions uh, continued to go forward. Uh, my convention was held in this very hotel in Cincinnati 15 years ago. I don't remember too much about it, except that there were about 450 people present. <laughs> uh, the, one, uh, the one innovation that I made in the program, which, uh, uh, like Gus's, has not been pursued since, <laughs> is uh, I was concerned that the convention was beginning to lose the attendance of some of our most distinguished senior scholars. 
And while I welcomed the fact that it was open to the participation of graduate students and junior faculty, I really wanted to try to have senior people there as well. And so I, I introduced a series of programs that I called Work in Progress. And for each of them I invited, there were four in all, and for each of them I invited one distinguished senior scholar in the field to talk informally about a research project in which he or she was then currently engaged and then invited two more junior colleagues to be respondents uh, to, to those programs. And my recollection was that they were, uh, that they were very stimulating and uh, attendance was, uh, was, was very good. Uh, I'm happy to say that we established during the years of the 80s that uh, the association was viable in every respect, that its membership rallied to the need, uh, its leadership was willing to put its collective money where its mouth was, uh, and we were able to come back from what was really a, a very difficult time. Uh, I'd say one other thing as a, as a personal note, in case we don't get to all of the questions on the, on the list, uh, I took office as president within a few weeks of the death in office of the then president of the National Association and the then president of the Western Regional Association. So I considered survival one of my <laughs> significant achievements. Thank you. Bruce? Um, I could comment on the story that's been going through years. I was the journal editor whose journals were being held hostage. Uh, <laughs> And then we were being charged rent for having them held hostage as well until bills were paid. But I won't do that. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave that to others. I did not have the great uh, cycle in office, the four-year cycle in office that all these people did, because I came in through special election. Uh, uh, an, an upcoming president of the association was asked by the executive committee to relinquish her office, Sharon Ratliff, because she was moving out of the region. And they didn't think it seemly that somebody out of the region would be president of this organization. Dennis didn't learn that lesson. Um, <laughs> uh, so I skipped the first year, the membership year, uh, and, and, mo and moved right into the programming of a convention. Uh, and it was the, I think it was the organization's first attempt at a suburban convention, Southfield, Michigan. It didn't dare go into Detroit. It had been offered downtown, it had been, it had been offered the, the new developing Renaissance Center, but nobody believed they could actually build it on time, so we, we stayed out in the suburb, which then led to an interesting problem of both. How do you get people to go anywhere near Detroit? And secondly, uh, what do you do for a suburban convention? <clears throat> While I was at Iowa at the time, uh, I'd had the, the great good fortune of, of growing up in the Michigan Speech Association, so I ran immediately to the regional or to the state association and said, if you ever, ever want to see this organization anywhere near the state again, you're going to have to fill the rooms. Uh, <laughs> and, and as a matter of fact, and as a matter of fact, did it. We went after the high school teachers association and the, uh, the high school principals association and said, you've got to deliver. Uh, that meant that that convention, in, in terms of innovation, if there were, some, were, were, were three, one, we tried to convince everybody to bring their family to fill the rooms up and said the Detroit Zoo was nearby. They could always take their kids to the zoo. Uh, second, we programmed hard uh, for high school teachers, uh, and that meant we began to do block programming on Saturdays uh, for high school teachers one, with a one-day uh, fee, special fee for those teachers to get them there and delivered a lot of workshops. Uh, the, the precursor of the gifts program, so-called swap shops, we'd bring in exchange materials and so on. And the, the other the thing that occurred to me as well it was how strong individual events were in that state and how important oral interpretation was in the state of Michigan, given Monty Oki's program at Michigan and a lot of other things. And finally came up with a clever idea. If you, if you program enough people in oral interpret, they'll act as audiences for themselves, and they'll come and come and come. And Reader's Theater was big, so we, we did uh, large Reader's Theater sections. In all, we had 96 people, we counted, coming in and around the various oral interpretation performances. Uh, that were that were laid in into that state. And all, unlike these people that had puny 400-person conventions, we had 625. It'd be one of the last of the 600 conventions, certainly outside of Chicago. Uh, and it was there because over one out of six were coming out of the Michigan high schools in, into that into that convention. Uh, <laughs> And again, it was part of that, certainly the temperament of that period in hopes that the association could maintain its spread of service uh, across the layers of, of the educational system uh, and, and, and hold it together. Uh, in terms of my year as, as president, we, the, we had the, uh, 
in part the usual array of issues and, and some different ones. One uh, was, again, the usual membership sort of issue and trying to hang on to members. I really didn't find out until after I moved uh, into the finance board of the of the Speech Communication Association that the reason we all had trouble is that 30% of your membership turned over every year. Uh, and when you're turning over 30% of your membership, I mean, it's an amazingly high figure. You've got to find ways to constantly renew. Uh, and, and so we had to figure out ways to, to renew and open, open our membership, and we took two initiatives. One, as I was suggesting already, was the high school service initiative. This was a period of states rewriting their certification requirements. We had in the region an expert on certification, Delty Herman at Western Michigan, and uh, with a phalanx of, of people who would, would help carry that, that message out, we began to build certification kits uh, for people and, and consultation. Uh, centers and programs for them. Uh, the Saturday workshops that, that would, would play into this as well that we were running. Uh, all tied then to the, to the notion that we've got to build and hold uh, membership uh, in, we certainly weren't kind of full K to 12 yet, but seven to 12 in, in, in that sort of area. And as, and as well along with that to, to bolster as much as we could, uh, especially in the larger states, uh, the community college membership. Again, I was sitting with my, after my years in, the, in, in, at, in Ann Arbor in a nest of large urban community colleges that, that represented great points. Uh, the second thing we did in terms of membership building was to attempt to diversify the intellectual leadership. It was when I was president that the, the, that the, the Women's Caucus was formed. Uh, I had gentle and persist gentle maybe not, persistent uh, <laughs> lobbying uh, from Ellen Reed Gold and, and Judith Trent uh, for, the, for this to go. It, it was easy enough to do. Uh, had help from, from Gus Friedrich, uh, who was finishing up in, in his executive secretaryship position and so on. So we launched the Women's Caucus as a way, not simply to diversify membership, but to diversify, as the argument was going, the intellectual base of the discipline as well, uh, which I think came along. And in, secondly, in the name of intellectual leadership, we launched the so-called Federation Prize. We, we, we put out the unheard of amount, uh, advertised the unheard of amount of $4,000 uh, for somebody to come and do a piece of scholarship. That has since become up to $4,000. But it, it nonetheless trying to make an intellectual imprint as well. In other words, working as they put the membership together on both the, the service uh, to high school uh, and, and community college uh, constituents that simply wasn't there in full yet, and then at the same time uh, working the other side. Uh, uh, the, other, the other dominant issue was, was matters of financial viability, and I, I don't want to go much into that. Um, we had decided that we probably should keep our money in more than savings accounts. Uh, uh, the, the CD was invented, and it was an important financial <laughs> instrument, and Gus was, was instrumental in that, in that shift. And to work on uh, the journal exchange, uh, really, because we were bigger than everybody else, we knew we'd sell more journals to them than they'd sell to us somehow. <laughs> so this was going to be a, a piece of financial leverage. It's a pity it, it got into somewhat uh, straightened uh, difficulties later on. But nonetheless, that became a financial instrument as, as well. Uh, we, we changed our, our printer. We went to a much more upscale, uh, faster printer, Pantograph. Uh, got out of the old standard printing uh, company that had done all of the journals in all, in, in, at all the, the uh, almost all the regions, except southern and, and national, for years and years. Uh, and again, an event to, uh, to make us a little faster afoot in that area. Um, otherwise, I think that, that was pretty much what we're doing. We were in good shape. We were still floating along with, with a large membership. We were pushing our journal circulation to 2,000 issues, uh, numbers per issue, and it, it, we were looking really good. And then, and then all these people let it crash. <laughs> I, I, thank you, Bruce. Uh, David, just, just for historical record's sake, um, what year was it that you all became aware of the real financial problem? I mean, what, were you just president, or you, you had just been the second vice president? Or? Well, when you say the real financial problem, you mean the real cause of the yes. problem? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it became evident the year after uh, I was president. Uh, during my presidential year, the president-elect, Barbara Wood, uh, took aggressive leadership of this aspect of, of the issue, uh, and we were able uh, to obtain access to bank records uh, 
uh, that established that the problem was other than we thought. Yeah. We sent you, Donovan Oaks and I were sent to a bank to look at the checks that could not be found that had not been circulated. And we found a pattern, uh, check after check after check. We then went for lunch, um, saying, what, what, what have we found? And, but that, that was, that's right, that was Barbara that pushed it. That was yeah. Barbara that pushed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have talked about uh, uh, many of the strengths and some of the vexing problems. And obviously, uh, the financial problems were pretty vexing at the time. But we haven't talked enough, perhaps, about uh, considering this association it's disciplinary contributions to scholarship. And uh, I know, David, let's begin with you to talk about that. I think we've hinted at this in some of the things we've said earlier. Uh, to me, the greatest contribution that this association has made is that it has always been a full service association representing the range and breadth of the discipline. Now, we can look back 25, 30 years and say, well, it was a much narrower discipline then. There were all sorts of things that we've discovered and opened up since that we didn't know about then. But at any given time, Central States, I think, has represented very well uh, the range of issues and concerns in the communication discipline. Uh, it has managed, I think, uh, probably better than any of the other regionals to both maintain traditions not in the sense of you know, encrusted traditions, but keeping alive some of the most traditional areas of research and, and teaching, and at the same time, not only welcoming change, embracing change, uh, but often being at the, at the forefront of identifying uh, emerging areas of, of scholarship. And it's done this through its convention. Uh, it's done this through its journal, which uh, I think is has typically enjoyed the reputation of being the strongest of the regional journals, but also the most balanced in terms of uh, the material that it, uh, that it publishes, uh, and in terms of, of the individuals who have uh, occupied positions of, of leadership within the association. Bruce, did you want to comment on this? I don't, I don't think, no, I, I, I'd echo that. Pretty much, it's the, speaking of the journal, it's, it's, I think it's interesting that, that communication studies is really a mirror of the quarterly journal of speech. They both run with very much that same kind, and this feeds into what David said, that, sa that same kind of uh, mission to, to reflect the discipline as a whole and balancing uh, both more traditional and more front-edge sorts of things with, with enough special features as well to keep up with emerging trends. And, and I think it goes back to my uh, initial point, uh, which is ever so slightly self-serving, but nonetheless true, um, which is a nice thing when it's self-serving, <laughs> which has to do with, with central states, I think, really aware of itself as, as a birthing ground for, for the field generally. Um, I certainly enjoy other associations and other conventions and other journals. I especially like Western because that's called getting out of Iowa in February. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 a, and a lot more uh, sorts of things. And part of my intellectual work is, is very much anchored there. And yet the part of me that, that uh, was raised in the same department Dennis was with the same faculty in, in the 60s is strongly grounded in, in, in Central. Thank you. Um, Gus? Just kind of uh, I'm providing an example of what David uh, talked about, uh, the idea that we've uh, built on a solid foundation, maintained it, and advanced it. Uh, I was uh, reading Lauren Reed's uh, A Fan for, for the 50s, and this is a description of how the journal started. A typical early issue contains six to eight major articles, each, however, only four to eight pages long. The content was largely that of speech education, speech education for adults, organization of a high school speech course, a cooperative program of speech improvement for elementary uh, children in Nebraska rural schools. Most articles were written out of the author's experience or based on a simple survey. And so the first journal uh, focusing on speech education, and I remember when I started at Purdue, that was a very prominent part of the program at Purdue. We had uh, Bob Kibler, Larry Barker, Ellis Donaldson, uh, Ray Ewing, Bill Brooks. Uh, and so I joined a bunch of colleagues who were very much into speech education. 
And speech education at that time consisted of uh, preparing high school teachers. It consisted of preparing uh, people to direct the basic course. It consisted of preparing people to uh, train uh, debate coaches. And so speech education was relatively traditional. And uh, a, a lot of uh, the research uh, was uh, more uh, uh, sit down and talk about it rather than actually collecting data. But uh, notice that I mentioned Bob Kibler, and I think Bob was very influential in terms of uh, um, moving the discipline in a way that took uh, speech education and created instructional communication in a way that built a body of literature that then uh, went off to be shared with people uh, in other disciplines. Because Bob's view was that, uh, you know, this is a wonderful area of research because we're actually studying things uh, that are real. Uh, because we're doing instructional kinds of issues on uh, college campuses. And so let's study what's happening in our classrooms and let's study what's happening in other classrooms and share the communication dimensions of that with teachers throughout academe. So I think uh, we have built on a solid foundation in terms of uh, interest and in rhetoric, uh, in terms of social science kinds of issues, but we keep adapting and building uh, and uh, we're, I, I think, uh, in the Central States region, uh, the uh, people, as witness uh, what's been said in terms of our journal and our success on the national level, where a lot of these ideas germinate Thank and disseminate. You. Dennis? Well, if I may backtrack just sure, for a second, sure. uh, I neglected to say earlier that one of the major issues in my administration was uh, why the great state of Ohio and particularly the great city of Cincinnati were being systematically ignored as places to host conventions. And <laughs> I'm pleased to say that we had uh, uh, one it that took uh, only a few short he years uh, <laughs> presided over and, and we are back here again. So that, uh, that was progress. Uh, we <laughs> overcame the uh, uh, anti-Cincinnati uh, bias in convention selection sites. and. Uh, from my vantage point, that was a good thing that we did. This is a great place to have a convention. Uh, I guess I would have to say, along with Bruce, anything I would say about uh, our contribution uh, uh, as a uh, uh, purveyor of uh, scholarly information via our journal would seem to be uh, uh, self-serving, but uh, I think that um, Communication Studies is a first-class journal. It has uh, uh, rigorous refereeing standards. It has a rejection rate that is right up there with the uh, national journals, and uh, it has produced information that I think on the whole is more reader-friendly than in a lot of our uh, professional journals. And uh, uh, so I think this association through that vehicle has contributed to uh, not only advancements in scholarship, but also advancements that uh, people can more easily assimilate into their teaching or their own uh, research agendas. So um, I would give us high marks on uh, the contribution that we've made to uh, scholarship as an organization. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's change the topic here just a bit and talk about in your years of leadership what were some of the relationships with other regionals, with the national associations? So, on Bruce, let's begin with you again. Well, the, the in, in terms of the relationships, there, there's all there's always been uh, a, a concern for vertical relationships. Regional associations afraid of being absorbed by the national association, but in turn hoping they can suck up the state associations into their orbit and get all their members to join. <laughs> uh, there, during the period I was president, there was much talk about uh, about a, a single pay membership that would put you in all three uh, and allow you to go forward then in, in a great package and integrate some of the aspects of convention and publishing and so on. But everybody really afraid that that there was a there was somewhere around there a great white shark. Uh, that was going to eat you and not feed you. Uh, so that, that, that kind of, of, of relational issue, is, is, it's just been a kind of an enduring one. Uh, it then leads, it's, it's flip side of course then is to try and understand what is distinctive about a professional association at the national, the state, and, 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 and the regional sit, sitting in between those regional levels. And I think a regional associations always have trouble trying to decide what they're doing 
the state associations have such strong pedagogical traditions and their job to, to service the teachers of a state, their missions tend to be fairly focused. The national can, can have that, that sense that it is, it is, the, it is the overall, it, is, it does represent the state of the discipline uh, without boundaries, uh, not, not counting the oceans, which of course makes some of our, our international colleagues very unhappy, but it does have that sense of being the national voice. And the regional associations have had to try and figure out what it is. Uh, I, I actually was on a panel once uh, up on, on a Saturday night in Washington, D.C. at an SCA convention called What's Regional About Regional Associations, and 17 people came to find out. Uh, <laughs> it, it was almost, Im but almost impossible uh, for, for us to, to do that, is, is we don't make much use of our regional identification. What, what we did with other regional associations, say, is look for, for various grounds of, of cooperation. The journal exchange, the meeting of the regional executive directors with each other at least once a year uh, at, at the national meeting and so on to see what they shared in common and what they could do for each other, I think, has been, is, is something that has been very, very healthy. Uh, but but still, uh, I, I think each is is so different in in the way it, it operates its own its own administrative traditions, uh, and if, frankly the way it, it, it cuts its own goals out, uh, that those relationships m uh, are maintained as, as 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 I say at least as as tentative. To be in an intellectual financial arrangement is one thing. Uh, to be more fully integrated is another. Uh, Gus. I was just thinking as uh, Bruce spoke that uh, some of what happens at the state, regional, and national levels is uh, a matter of timing and a matter of funds. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to get uh, elementary and high school teachers to a national conference because uh, of their job. And so the uh, states have really kind of uh, been an attempt to meet the needs of underrepresented, underserved. And uh, the regionals have sort of been a broker between the national and the state associations in that kind of way. Uh, and, uh, and I think also, in addition, the regions have been uh, home, and I think this is especially true of central states, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, uh, smaller colleges more so than some of the larger college. I know it's been a, a topic of conversation for many of us uh, that uh, some of our uh, colleagues at some of the more prestigious graduate programs have not been in attendance at regional conferences to the level that we wish they might. Uh, and that's been a continuing dialogue uh, all the time that I've been involved in terms of the regional conferences. Uh, I was just uh, thinking in some of the things that we do in terms of uh, cooperation, and I, ju I just want to uh, highlight what Bruce said in terms of the Federation Prize. As far as I know, that was the first attempt by a regional to do that. And I, uh, I, maybe my memory's faltry, but I remember that as Bruce's uh, advocacy. It happened while I was uh, uh, president, but Bruce is the one who really uh, pushed it, developed it, and spearheaded it, as I recalled it. Uh, I, I also think uh, the regional thing, uh, one that I kind of like, uh, and uh, I, I could be faulty here too, but I remember Judy is pushing this idea, and that's the uh, joint venture between uh, Southern and uh, Central in terms of conferences. The first one, I think, according to the convention program anyhow, was in St. Louis in 87, and Barbara Wood uh, planned it. Uh, uh, but I, I recall Judy being the uh, person who kind of pushed us in that direction. The second one, uh, Linda Moore planned in Lexington, and the third one, uh, Sandy Metz planned uh, in uh, uh, St. Louis. And so uh, we've, we've had three of those, and they've all been uh, very well attended uh, and uh, I think have been good experiences uh, for those of us uh, who have been at them. I think another feature uh, of our particular region is the state's advisory committee, uh, which at various times has worked well and less well. But each of the states uh, with active programs have elected representatives, and that state's advisory committee then has met uh, at the central region and has done some wonderful things over the years. Thank you. Gus, uh, Dennis, do you want uh, to add to I, this? I don't think I can add anything to what <laughs> Gus just said. I mean. <laughs> it was so brilliant. Yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> it was good. David. Well, during, during my years, our relations with the National Association was primarily one of supplicant. <laughs> and uh, I think we did our, our best to keep our heads up uh, during that period of time and uh, convince them that we weren't all irresponsible and spendthrifts and all of that. But at the same time, uh, I think we managed to uh, be a good neighbor, not only to the National Association, but to other regional associations with whom we were involved in this journal exchange. 
Uh, Gus mentioned the joint convention with Southern. Uh, that occurred uh, during the year that I was president. I had nothing to do with its planning or with its conception, but I was able to reap many of the benefits of it. Uh, and to see how two regions with, in some respects, different cultures and in some respects overlapping interests uh, could find the convention program enriched by coming together. And I think the very wise decision that the people who planned that convention made was that it wasn't going to be two separate conventions under one roof, that wherever possible, every one of the programs really was a joint uh, effort that brought people together who would often not appear on the, on the same convention program or, or panel together. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that we've continued that and done a couple since then, and we almost have one this year since Southern is just down the road in Lexington, and some of us are going back and forth between the two. Uh, otherwise, I, I agree entirely with what Bruce and Gus have said. All right, thank you. Uh, we want to save some time for uh, Linda to conclude, but I want to ask one fast question. I think it won't take very long, and that is, as you look back at those years in central states, um, what do you think have been some of the most rewarding aspects or benefits of those years and your involvement in the leadership of this association, both to you and perhaps if you will tell us to the association, although I think we've already had some information there. Why don't we begin, uh, Gus, with you? I think the uh, most immediate thing that comes to mind is friendships that you form. I, I think it's been uh, kind of alluded to, though, in terms of this, that uh, there's sort of a natural sequence. I remember uh, when uh, I was at Purdue, uh, uh, Don Zachariasen and Dick Johannesson uh, at my first uh, uh, Indiana Speech Association meeting uh, got me uh, involved in that organization as an officer my first year there. And that kind of uh, worked in terms of the regional re uh, as well. Uh, uh, I, I ended up, uh, um, because Dave Berg was coming to Purdue as the executive director, because Dave had been the one before, and so I took it over. And then when I went to Nebraska, I left it behind for the last year, and so Dave took it over, and then it moved to uh, Carl and uh, Moore. And uh, uh, so uh, it, it was kind of a natural sequence that from executive of, uh, secretary to the presidency, uh, uh, editorship, of uh, communication education and then NCA presidency. And I think many of us went through uh, those kinds of experiences and I think the uh, relationships you form. And then I think one of the things I take a great deal of pride in uh, is uh, when I kind of look through the convention program, I look through uh, for students who uh, I've been on committees for, like Bill Eady and others, uh, and uh, people who uh, I've chaired their committee, uh, like uh, uh, Pam Cooper uh, and Cash Book and others. And I take a great deal of pride of seeing uh, people that I've uh, had uh, worked with in terms of student kinds of relationships or other kinds of relationships and uh, get to see them at conferences uh, and especially at the Central States Conference. Dennis? Well, I, I can only say in respect to benefits that uh, as a result of my involvement uh, in and membership in this organization, things have happened to me that I am professionally, that I'm sure, would not have uh, happened. Uh, and in that respect, I am uh, beholden. I've been the recipient of a lot of recognition and uh, awards that uh, uh, are, represent more than uh, anyone could reasonably expect to have and probably were not deserved in, in all cases. But uh, for that, I'm, uh, uh, as I said, beholden to uh, this organization. In terms of what has been uh, rewarding, uh, this may strike you as unusual, but uh, as much as uh, I have read about organizations and groups and how they function, uh, Central State Speech uh, Association and uh, Communication Association, during the period I have been uh, a member of it, uh, has made it clear to me what is essential for an organization or a good organization to operate. And uh, it becomes evident if you are part of the leadership structure of this organization that a good organization cannot function very well or survive even. Uh, under circumstances in which the roles that have to be fulfilled are not being enacted 
voluntarily and with a sense of commitment and goodwill. And that has been rewarding to see this organization operate with uh, uh, so little need for anyone in a position of authority to prod the process to operate as it should in the interests of achieving its, uh, its objectives. Uh, so in that uh, frame of reference, I guess I'd have to say the most rewarding part of having been associated with this organization is the people who are involved. David. Well, first of all, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about parts of the discipline that I wasn't very familiar with uh, intellectually, and I learned a lot about some of the organizational issues in the, in the discipline itself, uh, both in the, in the region and, and nationally. And that's been very valuable to me and had a good deal to do with success that I've been able to enjoy in, in the years since. Uh, as others have said, I think the personal friendships and relationships that were formed as a result of holding a leadership position in, in this association have been personally uh, just very rewarding. Uh, I learned a lot about how to put conventions together. Uh, in some respects, they're like debate tournaments, which I had some familiarity <laughs> with, but in some respects, they're not. Uh, people who come don't do this every week. Uh, the unit planners don't necessarily understand why you can't have all the programs between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. None of them can fit <laughs> with each other and none on Sunday. Uh, and sort of figuring out the kind of logic of how a convention gets put together and, and operates was a very valuable experience. And I guess finally I would say while, while I've dwelt in some of my other comments on some of the financial issues that the association had to deal with, and uh, I certainly would not want us ever to have to go through that again. Uh, there was some satisfaction in working through uh, that set of issues. I mean, it reminded me a little bit of back when I was debating, uh, trying to research a difficult issue and figure out what the heart of the issue really was and uh, develop a case and uh, I uh, helped to convince what was then a fairly conservative national leadership to uh, take a chance on a regional association that was uh, at the base very, very strong. Uh, and then while lots and lots of people were involved in this, and I don't mean in any way to, to claim the credit for it personally, but it's been a great source of satisfaction to know that that set of problems was successfully resolved. Thank you. And Bruce, let's conclude with you. Uh. The, I, I agree with very much of what what is what is uh, been said here. I think it's important uh, to develop as a as a as an educational professional uh, a service mentality and work inside a service uh, inside a service culture. It's the part of your job you say you never paid for. It's not, no one wants to reward it uh, or put it into the reward scheme, and you try to figure out how to make it work. Uh, and, and yet it's at this level, that at the regional level, that, that as David said, you really learn how a professional association works. I had a wonderful time being brought up by the Michigan Speech Association uh, as a 26-year-old as a, as a kid with hair, uh, and, and, brought, and brought into that and, and educated uh, on, a, on a basic sense of, of my, on my professionalism in the integration of different aspects of education. Though it wasn't until I got to working at, at Central States that I began to understand how you put that machinery together and to make it work in the planning of conventions, uh, in, the, in the collection and the disbursement of funds for various kinds of activities and so on. Uh, and it certainly was then in that sense preparation as well for what was my next move from that presidency to the finance board of the Speech Association of America, Speech Communication Association, National Communication Association, where then I just, you just take it at a different scale, but it, I'd learned the parts of, of an operative organization, uh, organization here. Uh, although, as I said, basically the message that comes through to all of this is is really what 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 is the range of of of, of a educational professional service? I I think uh, even obligations, uh, much to the chagrin of my colleagues, sometimes pushing that notion. That it isn't. It is. It is. It's nice personally. I've got phenomenal ranges of personal reviews, but it's also for the development of of a professional culture. I think uh, that we have an obligation, and and at this level is where I learned how to make that work. 
Thank you. Just one real quick comment. Uh, I, j I just remembered when Bruce planned the program, he talked about uh, his pr program in Detroit. He didn't have interest group chairs to help him. There were no interest groups, and so he had to plan it all by himself because we didn't have interest groups until my predecessor came along. And so uh, when Bruce was planning, he did it all by himself. But until you told me it's only 77 programs and shoot, she planned twice that. <laughs> I thought I'd planned so many, and I was. it seemed like it because it was the 50th anniversary, and last year when... Uh, Professor Berryman Fink was putting together the program, and I was saying, oh, City, take a look at some of these things. I, it was, a, and Jimmy did the history of the Journal and the Association. It was, it was like this thick. It was just ridiculous. And of course, Cynthia's was like that, so <laughs> time changed. Linda. I want to thank our panelists. Um, as someone who took over at Beams, executive secretary in the late 80s, I can really appreciate firsthand the leadership and the stability that this group of panelists, Judy included, brought to the organization. And just as a point of putting this in perspective so that uh, we, we know what they've been alluding to uh, during the discussion, I believe that when uh, one particular executive secretary took over the budget, there was approximately $50,000 in the coffer. And four years later, there was $24.50. <laughs> so that perhaps puts in perspective some of the comments that our, our colleagues were making today. And um, all the more reason why we really truly are indebted to the leadership. Because in many ways, the decisions that you made, the vision that you had for the organization, and I think the love that you have of the organization, um, causes us really to be here today to be able to celebrate that. And so I do want to thank you. I do, however, want to turn back to the wonderful gold book that, that Gus has been referring to on and off because I was reflecting, as I was listening to this panel, there's one line in particular that Lauren Reed wrote in this book that I think uh, is appropriate to read. After listening to this panel, our founders would be astonished beyond words. Uh, astonished in several ways, I think. Uh, I'm hoping that they would be astonished by the, the, the growth of the association, the scholarship of the association, and the leadership of the association, and the passion for the association that's been demonstrated here today. But I do want to close this particular dialogue that we've had in continuing the tradition, uh, again, with words from Lauren Reed, because I think it's important that we have um, a sense of stability in, in thinking about how Lauren has seen the association. And I believe that Lauren is the oldest continuing member of the association who has certainly taken an interest in every step of its development uh, to date. He says, somewhere around the corner is a vision of greatness. People will continue to come along to help us as a discipline and as an association. And I think that the panel that we've seen here today and remembering the panel that we heard last year um, provides us very evidence of this words of wisdom that Lauren shared with us. So, again, I thank you, and I look forward to next year when we assu will assume our last panel. And I, I want to try to, to encourage you to come to that one next year, too, because it will be a history-making uh, event. The officers that we're going to be uh, gracing the table next year are all female, which I think is going to be a comment on um, a different avenue of the association. I do, it would be, as, as chair of the current finance committee, it would, uh, it would bode me well and bode the organization well to remind you that this tape can be purchased. <laughs> as well as last year. As well as last year. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I do. And talk with you. Okay. I will. All right. Thank you, Gus. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. We did have a great time.